Well, what we want to do is begin with our, our next presentation, uh, which is coming from Adria Carbo. Uh, and Adria is a, a PhD student, nearly completed, uh, in our interdisciplinary PhD program in genetics, bioinformatics, and computational biology, uh, or GBCB as we call it here. And I'll probably be mentioning it more than once, and I'll even have some little flyers out asking you to perhaps take them back to your universities and so on as we try to, to bring more good students to Virginia Tech as part of this program. Uh, when I say he's nearly completed, his defense is next Monday. So when we... <laughs> 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 Uh, and saying that with, with that said, if any of you have any questions you think ought to be asked in his defense, I'm on his committee, Joseph's his, his chair, so we can certainly ask those questions. Something really hard would be good. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he is working with Joseph Osagan in the Riera. He's part of the MIT program, and in the uh, NIML lab, you'll see a lot of these, another abbreviation, Nutritional Immunology and Molecular Medicine Laboratory. Uh, Ad Reed comes to us from Spain. Uh, he got his BS in biotechnology from the uh, University, Universitat de Vic. Uh, and first came to Virginia Tech working with Joseph as an undergraduate intern, and then he returned for graduate study in the GDC program. Uh, and he really exemplifies the goals of what we try to accomplish in GDC, where we have people with expertise in both experimental methods and in computational methods. And you'll see that as a result of this talk. And one other thing I, I like to mention, I think I introduced him once before for a seminar perhaps, uh, he's also a bit of an entrepreneur um, in that while he was uh, a student in Spain, he formed a company called Carpe U, something like that, uh, in Barcelona. And it was uh, designed to promote nightlife in Barcelona. Um, <laughs> but I think he's probably. <laughs> I think he's very promoted. <laughs> but I think he missed an opportunity of not trying to do the same thing here in Blacksburg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, the title of his talk is uh, it's different than what I have here. So, uh, I'll PPAR gamma activation drives TH17 cells in, into a T-ray phenotype. Well, thanks everyone. Um, today I'll be giving you an exact example. I, this morning, uh, they gave an introduction on how computational modeling works, can take uh, an overview of CD4 T cells, and now what I will show you here is how we can get from an experimental view on CD4 T cell differentiation, and how we can compute and simulate a model in order to generate predictions and within the context of CD4 T cell differentiation. Um, and before I start, let me tell you one thing. Um, when I started my PhD, and I consider myself you know, when I started, I had no idea about computational you know, uh, immunology. Actually, I jump-started um, my PhD by going to a summer school for a, a workshop that was very similar to this. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because we talk about computational modeling and and immunoinformatics in conferences, everyone is so scared about you know, models and differential equations. And there are ways, the ways that I'm going to show you today, uh, where you can use a very user-friendly <coughs> piece of software, such as Copacity, that will work the math for you, and then you can just focus on the immunology, which is what you have expertise on. So let me uh, jump into the presentation. I uh, can show you this uh, cycle in here, and this is what I will be uh, going over today. Um, what we do within the Modeling Immune People and Therapy Pathogen Center, one of the modeling approaches we have is first, um, we go to the literature, we do literature mining, we also have some in-house generated data, and with all this information, what we do is we create a network. And this afternoon, we will teach you guys how to create these networks. Once we create this network with Cell Designer, what we do is we implement this network into modeling software. And in this case, we implemented the network in Google Copacity. And again, all these processes will be brought to you this afternoon. Once you figure out the parameters and everything in Copacity, what we do is we start running in silo experimentation. So computational simulations, scans, time forces, in silico knockouts. Uh, and the reason we do this is to generate novel predictions. And once we have these novel predictions, what we do is go back to the lab and run in vitro and in vivo animal models. And in vivo can be with uh, mice models. We run uh, validation studies with pig models. Uh, we also have some 
human uh, stuff going on. And then what we can do is go to that prediction, test it in the lab, and validate and say, yes, this, this works. And then, of course, once we have this data, this is available data, then we can come back into the model. So it's a natural cycle that we've been following. And this is our model approach. So today, with this presentation, uh, my goal is to walk you through these processes so you understand how we do how we do the model here. All right, this is a little bit of outline. Uh, I'll give you some background introduction, and I'm, I'm going to go really fast. Uh, I just have one or two slides in C4, but can I mean, uh, tremendous introduction on C4, so I'll go by that very quick. I'll introduce you to the CD4 Design Computational Model. Um, we'll talk a little bit of model calibration. I'm going to link that to some of the activities that we'll be running in the afternoon. Um, I'll show you the in silver experimentation that we run and how we set up our strategies to find this novel hypothesis. Uh, and then I'll show you what we did to experimentally validate the hypothesis that we came up to. And that's the conclusions that we did. All right. Um, as immunologists, you know the immune system is characterized by two big response, adaptive uh, and innate immune response. Uh, the innate immune response, I want to highlight that is very non-specific. Um, so we have these macrophages, these dendritic cells and neutrophils, one of the first barriers of the immune response. Secondly, we have the adaptive immune response, which is more specific. You see CD8 T cells, B cells, and then our object of study, which is CD4 T cells. Which, as you may know, orchestrate uh, adaptive and also the immune uh, response by secreting these factors, these cytokines, uh, and other soluble factors in the environment. So, the CD4 T cell differentiation and development, or in other words, for a CD4 T cell to be fully differentiated, it needs three different signals, as you may know. First, it needs a PCR engagement, the PCR receptor. It needs a post-immunotory signal, it is usually mediated by CD28, but also it needs a cytokine signal. So the CD40 cells, uh, CD40 cells have various receptors for numerous uh, cytokines. And cytokine signaling needs to happen for a CD4 and a CD40 cell uh, decide where am I going to go, what I'm going to differentiate to. And this model, the CD40 cell model, focuses on cytokine signal. So as you can see here, um, CD40 cell differentiation is quite a complex process. We have an AIM CD40 cell, as Ken was saying, that depending on the cytokine milieu uh, that, um, or, or how the environment is composed of which cytokines, this AIM CD40 cell will differentiate into different phenotypes. And of course, each phenotype has different functions and also has its landmark transcription factors that will be expressed. As Ken was saying, a naive T cell that has I or that encounters IL-12, in or interferon gamma in the environment will differentiate with the H1, express specific transcription factors such as T-Vector or STAT1, and then secret interferon gamma. Um, this presentation will be focused on TH7D, which is induced by IL-6 and pgf uh, expresses ROR gamma T and secretes IL-7. And uh, I do recommend highlighting here is induced by TGF beta, secret also TGF beta, and other anti inflammatory cytokines such as IFN, and expresses FOXP3. Now, the CD40 cells, as I was saying, that the, this process is, is complex. It's not only uh, an activator pathway type of process, also other cytokines that are in the environment will inhibit different pathways. So it's quite a, it's quite a, a, a complicated process. Also, there are some other transcription factors that do, they are not part of a specific phenotype, but they are in CD40 cells. An example, PPAR gamma, and I'll be talking about PPAR gamma now, that can mediate the plasticity of different phenotypes. All right, so let's jump into the CD40 cell computational model. This is the network, I don't know if you can see this here, but this is the network uh, that we created showing CD40 cell differentiation. And this network represents four different phenotypes. Uh, we have our TH1 right here, our TH2 pathways right here. We also have our TH17 pathways in the upper right. And last, we have our, our T-Red. Um, the way this model works 
works, and you'll be playing with this model in the afternoon. See these external side effects here? This model, with this model, we are able to initialize the model in different ways. For example, if we set up our initial concentrations with IL-6 and TGF beta and no other cytokine, the model will activate the TH17-related pathways. Uh, if we change the cytokine environment, for example, if we just put uh, TGF beta right here and IL-2, the model will differentiate to an IT. So this afternoon, we'll show you in more detail how to play this model. Just to give you an overview of the model, it has 93 species and 52 reactions, which is considered a big comprehensive model. And these are how the ODEs look like. And as I said, yes? Yeah. Oh, uh, good question. So if we go back, I'll show you here. All right, you see, for example, here, um, this would be our IL-10 uh, activation. The IL-10 receptor, when it binds the IL-10 external cytokine, this connection here, this is a reaction. So I'll be calling these nodes species, and this will be the reaction. So for instance, if A goes to B, the way these two proteins are linked is by a reaction. And I'll be talking a lot about the reaction. ODE, this is, for example, the uh, ODE that calculates the differential expression of external interferon gamma in this model over time. And um, I didn't write this. This was generate, uh, generated by the <coughs> uh, And all the models that you will look with Kopasi, all these ODEs will be generated for you. You don't need to worry about that. And, and I'm not planning on you guys reading this, but just so you have an idea, these are all the equations <coughs> together of this model. So it's, it's a big model. Going back real to your question, when A, we have a node A um, goes to B, this is linked by the reaction, as I was saying. But how fast is that reaction going? Or is it is it very fast? <coughs> is it in a slowly fashion? Is it going, is it holding on to B? Is it holding on to A? Um, the way we have to dynamize these reactions is by setting up specific parameters in this reaction. Um, a more uh, specific example of the model, we have our external interferon gamma binding to the receptor of interferon gamma, and this will create an interferon gamma uh, membrane uh, complex. Now, this equation is uh, governed by different parameters. The more parameters, the more complex your function, your reaction is. And you may have the question now, OK, that's great. We created a model. We created a network. But how do I choose which value should I give to these parameters? There are so many. I have no idea if it should be 0 0.1 or 1 10, 10 to the 6. We don't know. Luckily, we have a process thing for a new estimation that will help us with experimental data to set up all these values. Because at the end of the day, we need to adjust the dynamics of the model. A model without dynamics is just a static picture. There's nothing going on. So how do we do this with capacity? And again, this is something you'll be learning uh, this afternoon. We have our experimental data, or, or, or in-house generated data. And we put this data all together in a calibration data. Okay. Um, you will be taught how to put together this calibration database later today. And what we do with this calibration database is we import this experimental data into Copasi, and Copasi will run an algorithm that will set up all these values. And this process is called parameter estimation. So pretty much what you need to calibrate and specify your models is just your experimental data. Copasi will do the job. Once we have the results, they will look like this. And um, let me explain to you this, this figure here. This calibration, this example here, uh, comes from a four experiment calibration database. Uh, zero, one, two, and three, these four experiments. Now, this was uh, data that we took from a paper from Betelli, a uh, nature paper that describes the crosstalk between TH17 and TREC. And they run different, four different experiments. The first one was where cells only stimulated with TGF beta. The second one were cells stimulated with IL-6. The third one were cells stimulated with both 
DGFN and IL-6, and the last one was an unstimulated culture. And what we can see here, these values here at the top, the red, blue, and uh, you can, don't worry about these two, but the red and blue are for FOXP3, the light blue and the purple are for IL-17. This right here is the measured value, is the experimental value, the value that you give to capacity with your calibration database. And here with DGF beta, you can see how the experimental value falls in the hundreds. Copasi, this blue value here, Copasi is able to fit this point. So what Copasi is doing here is tweaking all these parameters in the model, running this algorithm, and then it will say, okay, I was able to fit this experimental data here. So you see how these two points are very close together, and same for these two, same for these two, same for these two. What happens with IL-17, for example? We have IL-17, the measure value is up here. The fitted value is together with it. So this is an example of how a good premier estimation uh, results. Yes. Sorry, I missed. What are the x and y axes again? Are like these scores? Or what, like, what do you mean by those? Uh, these y axes would be the concentration of the model. And these x-axis, uh, Copasi by default uh, with the x-axis, but we just represent the first experiment, the second, the third, and the fourth. Yeah. Do you have the example of the real experiment, the digital experiment? Sure. And do you this by now, and how many cells, or how long, how do you set up this so you can think of that? Uh, if I remember correctly, what the value that I was giving here was the run of the digital cultures with TF17, and then she measured IL17 and POSP3. Um, depending on the data you need for calibration, the reason why we decided to use this paper was because it gave us, our story was, or it is, we have an induction of a CD40 cell, and then we measure what happens in the intracellular compartment, which is exactly what she did here. I used these cells differently, and then I check, I uh, measure what happens in the interstellar uh, compartment. So this was a really good fit for our model. Uh, but you can choose, depending on the model you want to create, you will need to choose which kinds of data you want to use for calibration purposes. So another thing, uh, so when back in the day, when you were talking about the deterministic model, you're not, it's not a stochastic model. Sure. So basically, you are assuming that the data that you are getting from the experiments are inherent to Gaussian and is the high form of the because these processes are expected to stochastic in some ways. So about the thing that you can do or sure. the parameter as well. Mm -hmm. So there are two ways you can incorporate variability. Um, the first one is, um, in, I'm not going to show you the presentation, but I, I'll show you guys uh, later this afternoon or, or tomorrow as well. We have um, uh, tools that will run over deterministic model and tools that apply stochasticity to those deterministic models. So with that, you can check the variability of your simulations. The second way you can account for variability within the ODE scenario is these calibration databases. You can have different replicates. Uh, for example, this major value of POSP3 may be composed of three different replicates. And Copasi will calculate the average of these three. So you can account for very good for that, yeah. Can we learn what the fitting algorithms are this morning? You will yeah, learn. Can you repeat yeah. that question? Yeah, Cordy was asking if we will uh, learn how to run these algorithms in the afternoon. No, not how to run what, what algorithms you're actually using if we know the math side. Okay, so which algorithms we will use, the different kinds we have? Yes. So a question is like when you say the model um, estimation, you estimated the parameter only, or you also estimated the form of the equation? Um, so the question is, do you estimate your parameter values, or you are also guiding which function you should use for that specific reaction? We, for premier estimation, we just estimate the parameters. Now, if you see that your premier estimation hasn't worked, you can pinpoint and map back to your model and see what is not working. And maybe one of the things that's not working is that you're using a mass action function when you should be using a kill function or another type of distribution. Is likely going back a bit 
but I want to go back to establishing your initial network. Mm -hmm. This was also done solely on literature mining and your in-house data, or did you again use some site, some kind of algorithm, or what led you to establishing first this network of parameters and now on an algorithm? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, you have different options to create your network. In this case, this network was created solely with literature data and also our in-house generated data. Now, we will be showing again in the summer school ways, for example, you can make sense if you start getting pieces of different papers on the literature. Now, what happens if you have a sequencing data set? What, you know, it, it, there's a ton of data in there. We have ways to get the sequencing data set, and something we'll be showing you on Wednesday, and infer a network out of it. So there are algorithms that run for network inference as well. So I'm very new to this field. So I was wondering that once you got this picture from parameter estimation, how do you apply this graph to the model you showed in the previous slide? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, the Shivani is asking how you can apply these results into the actual model. So how you move from results into the parameters of the model. This is as easy as clicking one button in the past. <laughs> so at the end of the premier estimation, there will, and I'll show you this uh, there is a place where it says update your model. You just click in there and all the results of the premier estimation will just move to your actual model. So it's it's working, virtually. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Great. Um, something we want to do once we run our premium estimation is well, you know, we've set up all these parameters, but now we want to check if it's really working. So one of the things we did we did with this model is based on the central differentiation dogma that we have in here, we initialized the model with different cytokines, and then we made sure that the model was upregulating the nodes or the proteins that was supposed to upregulate and was also keeping downregulated other phenotypes uh, related molecules. So to give you an example, after calibration we initialized the model with just EGF beta and then we just made sure that the model is producing FOXP3 but it's not producing interferon beta for example. So it's, it, it's kind of like our quality control for the model. Uh, and this is the result of the quality control. And once we check that everything is good to go, then we stand by the control. And at this point is when we can start running our in silico or computational experimentation. Yes, Ron? One point on these graphs, the dashed lines or the predictions of the model? What is the prediction? What is the value? In this case, this is a result of a time core simulation. So everything you see here is computational. Okay. Um, the reason why I use dashed lines is because I had so many species in here for so many nodes that I wanted to use fast lines just so you can detect that one. Wow. So all of this is simulated that you just want to make sure the simulation makes sense. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Um, the first node that we wanted to check in this CV4 diesel model uh, was uh, the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor of gamma. Now, PBAR gamma is a nuclear receptor and transcription factor that has been um, uh, known to modulate some aspects of CD4 to cell differentiation. For example, the loss of PBAR gamma results in enhanced antigen specific proliferation and overproduction of interferon gamma. No PBAR gamma, <coughs> interferon gamma is going out the roof in CD4 disease. PBAR gamma inhibits the TH1 and, th and TH17 programs in experimental allergic encephalomyelitis. Also, it was fun how PPAR gamma inhibits more specifically TH17 when it's been induced with IL-6 and TGF beta. Uh, and it uses ROR gamma T. And then on the other side, uh, we have how PPAR gamma promotes anti-inflammatory responses. And I'm showing you PPAR gamma here. And this brings me back to one of the questions that was done earlier this morning, where you were saying, well, you have a big model, but what if you're only interested in, in this small one? So this is an example. We have a very big comprehensive mo model that allows us to work with a lot of flexibility because we can check a lot of things. But, but we can check what happens with this specific model in response to these other number of molecules. 
So the first thing we wanted to check with PPAR gamma computationally is, well, uh, does the activation of PPAR gamma influences the differentiator, with differentiation for the state of a CD4 T cell? And we focused on TH17. So we have our the T cell that we use with IL6 and TGF beta. It will differentiate into a TH17. And what we did was we run a scan. Now you may have a question of what is a scan? Scan is a specific task of opacity that evaluates, that scans a concentration of a node you specify, and then uh, the, that's represented in the x-axis, and then in the y-axis you can check the concentration of different molecules of your model. What we saw in, with this specific simulation is that if we initialize the model to a D17, so we have our work LT and IL17, but we give increasing concentrations of PPAR gamma, these T817 related molecules in a single cell environment will go down and then Fox will go up. So this was kind of our first thing to say, well, is this T817 being plastic and differentiating back into a zebra? So that was our first thing. And we continued uh, oh, this explanation of this case. And we continued with the computational uh, simulation. The next one was to check um, what would happen if you have a model that's a fully differentiated TH17, and at some point during uh, the lifespan of this TH17, PPAR gamma gets activated. What would happen? So for that, we initialize the model into a TH17, and then we run a time course. And then at some point in the time course, we created an event and an event is an action that you are telling the model to activate at some specific time, and we'll get into that this afternoon as well. But at some specific time, we said, okay, now activate the target. And what's going to happen to the model? And what we observed is that these th 7 related molecules went down, and this FOXP3 went up. So again, we're seeing how a th 17 once the target is activated, to so stand regulates the th 17 machinery and up regulates the T-Rex. Yes, Osprey? So I guess I'm a little lost. Um, what is this simulation based on? So you saw this initial data set you're talking about paper, but what is this um, simulation? How is it doing this? Is it one data to use it to develop these graphs? Um, mm -hmm. So the question that Osprey is asking me is what data is the modeling using? to produce these results. Um, I've just shown you a very small part of the calibration result, but there's actually a huge database behind this, this model. To calibrate this model, we had to break the Fermi estimations into different ones and calibrate different parts and, gener and generate and also gather a lot of data. So everything that the model represents is based on experimental data that we used for parameter estimation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so is this all in vivo data that your, your uh, parameter estimation is based on? Or is it from different? This result is a result <coughs> of different data sets that we've used for, for P or parameter estimation. From same species? Or from different species. Uh, one of the uh, items, and that's a good point, one of the uh, items that computational modeling uh, offers is that you can have uh, mouse data and pig data, for example, and if you need to calibrate your model, you can use both data, account for this variability, and also assume that your model may represent two different species. It would be great, for example, if we have an IPA data set and we have all these data coming from the same source. That reduces our variability in a great manner. But sometimes, for instance, with this model, we had the need to gather data from different places, and therefore we need to assume that this may be happening in different conditions. So after you have uh, estimated the parameters, do you perform a model validation of these different components? Yes, and I'll be showing you. Is she ready? So, since um, you said that all this model is based on experimental data, mm -hmm. so where does your hypothesis come from? I'll, I'll exactly show you that. So uh, what uh, Shivani is asking me is, if you are calibrating your model with all these data, isn't your model going to show you all these data? And the answer is, 
there are two data sets for modeling. The first one is for calibration. Once you have your calibration, you're going to run your slow experimentation. And then within slow experimentation, you can play like this. You can say, in a single cell uh, scenario, what happens if I aggregate the bar yellow? Well, we're seeing how this cell is switching from T17 to T red. But for instance, the data that we used to calibrate the bar gamma was just telling us, one paper was just telling us, it just inhibits R Y gamma T, but not in a single cell scenario. So what the model is giving you is this extra power of predictability where you can put all these pieces together from different publications and then see the big picture and see what's happening in just one cell. Did you have P-bar gamma in your model originally that you showed us, or did you set it up based on T-cell differentiation and then add it in as an experimental question? Mm -hmm. So Claire is asking if we added P-bar gamma uh, when we were setting up the model, or if it was added a posteriori. Um, we added P-bar gamma when we were constructing the model um, because we were interested in P-bar gamma. So your starting point in the model is based on the initial conditions you set for the cytokine levels or the T cell initial value. Yes. It doesn't have any antigen presentation or anything before that. So what she's asking is if our T cell model accounts for TCR activation. The answer is, is no, we don't have TCR. We don't have the TCR, no, because we're just modeling cytokine uh, signaling. But if you want to do that, with, uh, does Popassi have that? Uh, yes. You, you would be able to download this model, add the TCR related pathways, connect them, recalibrate, and use the model. Yes. Can you generate these models in a specific manner? Let's say you activate PPR gamma in DCs and you want to look at the effect of that in T cells. Can you do that? Yes. Um, the question that he's bringing up is a really good question. He is, what happens if you intracellularly activate PPR gamma in a cell type like the dream cell? Would, can you check what happens on the other side of the T cell? Yes. Uh, this model cannot do that. This is part of a multi scale model. So you are uh, now talking about what happens intracellularly and what happens at a cell to cell interaction level. We'll be talking about multi scale and showing you some examples of Thursday. Yeah. All right. The third uh, uh, experimentation of computational experiment that we run was a combination of a time course and a scan. And what's hanging here is a little bit confusing. So here we have time on the x-axis and concentration on the y-axis. Now, each different line is an increased concentration of PPAR gamma. So this is mixing our first scan with our time course, all right? But let's give an example, for example, here of phosphatry. When P bar gamma, um, and this is initialized on a TH17. So a TH17 with zero P bar gamma, the phosphatry is right here on this line, right here, this first line. The next line will have an increased concentration of P bar gamma at a, a specific interval. So this will be the next line. And then the next, the next, the next, the next, the next line as we increase the PPAR gamma concentration. So what this is telling us is, in a timely, or um, it's time dependent on the fact that we are increasing PPAR gamma and then FOXP3 is going up as these TH17 related molecules are going down. So this is a, a mix, it's another strategy that you can use in Copacity. And again, we'll show you how to do these things this afternoon as well. So after running all these predictions, oh, I have one more. Yes. The knockout. All right. So one of the really cool things I think that you can do with um, uh, computational models is that you can create specific knockouts of your model. And how you do that? Well, if you, for instance, um, downregulate the ability or you upgrade the ability of PPAR gamma to be activated, you are knocking out PPAR gamma in the system. And then you can get the system that's a PPAR gamma knockout and check what's happening with with, with the system with the S D, with the right, etc. So that's what we did. We have our TH17 here, and this is our wild type model, and this is a model where we apply the disability of PPAR gamma to upregulate. And what we can see is how these TH17 related molecules are being upregulated. All right? 
Now, if we initialize the model to TREC by just putting TGF beta uh, in the environment, Fox P3 in the wildcard is up here. When we knock out deeper again, the Fox P3 gets stuck right here. So there's another option you can do with the model. Um, so after all these predictions, the main hypothesis that we got generated from, from this model is, well, uh, we have an activation of PPAR gamma in kids and things that regulates. So one is PPAR gamma triggers a change in phenotype from kids 17 to DREC, clearly. Uh, second, we have this loss of PPAR gamma with the knockouts. Um, so PPAR gamma indeed modulates kids 17 and DREC phase. And third, the increasing concentration of PPAR gamma with the scan this is telling us that PPAR gamma can exert its effect in a dose-dependent manner. So with that, we go back to the lab, and what we are testing, oh, and these are the three different examples um, that I was mentioning to you. But as I was saying, with this, we go back to the lab with the main hypothesis that we want to test, which is, well, PPAR gamma activation drives the itself itself into an IT right field. And we started setting up experiments. The first experiment we set up was an in vitro experimentation. We used wild type plants and mice that lack PPAR gamma, specifically in CD4 T cells. And you may be very familiar with that. We isolated naive CD4 T cells, we enriched it, and then we cultured them under T817 conditions for 60 hours. Once these cells were differentiated, um, we checked. Um, Once these TH17 cells were differentiated, at that point, we check our YDMC and IL-17 using flow cytometry. Also, at this point, what we do with the cells is treat them with increasing concentrations of pyoglitazone, which is a PPAR gamma agonist. It activates And we also check, after some time, we also check the levels of our YDMC and IL-17. So what these results are telling us is, well, at this point, before starting the PPAR gamma or the pyoglitazone treatment, we can see how the wild types have less ROR <coughs> and IL-17 than the C before uh, this specific PPAR gamma knockout. Which is exactly what we saw with our computational prediction where we computed the silico PPAR gamma knockout. Also, we saw how with increasing concentrations of pyoglitazone or PPAR gamma activation, if you would see like that, ROR gamma T and IL-17 are being decreased. So ROR gamma T goes from 42 to 20, IL-17 goes from 11 to 5, 19%. Fox P3 on the other side is being, is, is being upregulated from 4 to 6, 41. Of course, if we run, uh, well, this is a computational prediction, which is in line with this. Uh, increasing concentration of PPAR gamma will downregulate DH17, will upregulate QRAM. Yes, Is pyoglitazone able to rescue the non PPAR gamma pieces? Yeah, Ronan is asking if PPAR gamma was indeed turning this DH17 uh, to QRAM. Uh, what we're seeing here is a change in the transcriptional machinery. So we are seeing obvious DH17 cells are in fact turning into TREX. And I'll show you one more piece in the in vivo experimentation where we saw how mice are, were getting better when we were upregulating the TREX. Yes? Uh, so you said the, the model was a single T cell, right? And you're, just, you're sending your initial concentrations. And obviously, this is at the population level. And it makes sense that if one T cell, the larger right now, the population level will follow. But, but do you also see the same thing if you actually model the whole population of T cells? With, with the same model, but all starting with yet slightly different concentration following over time, same if you get the same effect. Mm -hmm. So uh, he is asking if we see uh, similar results in population based models. Something we've been working on is, and going back to the multi scale, is having, for example, different entities of CD4 T cells where you can play with the intracellular compartment of each one, that what's going to be the cellular. Uh, um, response to that. That goes back to a multi-scale problem. Right. And for instance, in this case, it is a single cell model. So this can help you delineate what's going on, but yes, ultimately, you may want to check that in a multi-scale model. But of course, it's way more complicated. Just because it might not be 
So it might be that at the single cell level, it's, it's, going, it's going down slightly in all the cells, but of course it might be some cells going off and other cells staying True. Up. So that's important. True, and I agree with you. Another um, piece of information is when we validate our predictions, we just don't do it just in vitro. We also validate our predictions using in vivo animal models because also we believe that there are other factors that will account for these behaviors. Injury cells getting into place, and being some other cytokines, microphages going in ones and twos. Um, so that's why we also want to run the in vivo setting to confirm that this is actually happening when you have all these other factors that were mentioned. Yes. From a compartmental modeling perspective, uh, and with respect to kinetics or cell trafficking, uh, which specific uh, tissue does this represent? Like, is it the lymph nodes? The, mm -hmm. What did so, you find the results to be? Compared? So this would represent, uh, and this is based on the data we use for calibration. To calibrate, we use data from the vector size and induction size. Uh, so we assume that this behavior would happen in both vector sites such as a colonic laminopropia or a, a, a gastric laminopropia, but also at, at induction sites such as uh, lymph nodes, spleen. Um, now, this will happen if the environment uh, has all these cytokines. Uh, so it's, to calibrate this model, we had to also look for data that was coming from both places. So you do take into account the cell trafficking? Not explicitly, not explicitly in the model, but if with the in vivo experimentation, again, there's cell trafficking, and we were able to validate that as well. Okay. Yes? So when you say, and you, because you said this model is built on the single cell, and uh, you might have other factors for other cells. But so when you do the validation on your models, so when the new experiment coming out is different from your model prediction, so how you consider if this kind of um, difference is because of the model or is because of the new factor which you are not even considered? So the question is, once you see the validation results in vivo, for example, with other factors, how do you distinguish that this is because of a single cell or because of a compounded effect of different factors? So with this model, we're able to determine the single cell effect, and we can validate that with in vivo. However, if your question is in regards to a different factors that are coming into play, and you want to distinguish these other factors, then you have to move to a multi-scale uh, environment. Because with ODE, with a single cell model, you wouldn't be able to... Uh, no, say, so if you, you use a new data, you can still feed your model to the data, actually. You can just change the parameters, you will be in another one. But you also can include a new factor, which will make your model fit to all the data as well. So how do you choose both? Like You, you choose either have a new factor ah, or you just saying. change your model. So what you're saying is, why did we choose cytokine signaling if maybe other factors are affecting CD4 T cell differentiation? OK, as modelers, there is never, and Stefan, you're going to agree with me. <laughs> the perfect model does not exist. Um, you can have a very accurate model, but you will see that the more nodes and the more stuff you put in your model, the more complex calibration simulation uh, processes are. Um, at some point, when you develop your model, you have to stop and say, OK, now I'm going to test. And then once you have this validated model, you can continue. For example, one of the things that we're doing in the version 2 of the CD4 T cell model is adding other phenotypes, adding TH9, TH22. But you could also choose, I want to add a TCR, or I want to add uh, the effect of the dendritic cells, or I want to add trafficking of T cells, for example. Or you do that in another model, but yeah. Yes? I, I think I heard a question about that. If your data doesn't validate, what is the problem? Is it the model, or is it that your assumptions are wrong? Or I mean, how do you know what the problem is in that case? Uh -huh. We can get into a very easy cycle of just make a model fit, make a model fit, but maybe you're missing something key from your model. I mean, how do you know what, where 
validation. I didn't realize you're sad and evolving. What she's asking me is if your if your validation studies are not in line with your predictions, then what do you do? Um, the approach that you need to use if your validation studies are pointing out to a completely different direction. This means that during your calibration process, some of the assumptions you made were wrong. For example, if um, if we validated this, if we calibrated this model with just effector data, effector side data, and then we are seeing how this model is not validated, then maybe we did that assumption wrong. Maybe we need to expand and do like both effector and inductive uh, size of infection or, or, or immune response. Um, when your validation is not in line, one of the things you could do is, now that you have a data set for validation, use that data set for back to calibration. And then refine your model, refine your parameters. Maybe you're missing notes, maybe you're missing the self-trafficking. Uh, and it's just a matter of going through the cycle again and then coming up with new predictions. And, and we've had, I think, yeah. So this model has an age, nine, I'm already a six months, about seven years. And the model is about seven years old when we originally started. And at some point, we were fitting the data to the network to see a refined version. And we could fit the data. There was one particular region, and I can more specifically tell you what it is. But we could not fit. So we were looking at literature and to get more information about that part of the model. And we figured out that there's actually literature indicating that there might be another feedback. Adding the feedback into the model, the model suddenly is different. You do the same thing if you now have new experimental information. You put the first you try, which contradicts the model, the Z assumption. And first you try to adjust your parameters. If that doesn't work, then you're going to look if you're missing something. And if you miss something, or you may come up with hypotheses. If there's no other experimental uh, information, you come up with hypotheses about other feedbacks, other interaction between the planes. Once you add that, you try it and take its end. So the model is never finished. The model will evolve. And this model, yeah, as I said, has a life cycle of already seven years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in a little bit short of time. Um, um, of course, the, the cells that were coming from the ACV4 specific environment in knockout did not show this behavior in here. Um, and then we moved into in vivo experimentation. And that's part of the discussion that we were having about you know, the in vivo setting. In this case, we used an adoptive transfer model. So we had cells from these wild types uh, um, and also the CD4 specific PPAR gamma. We have reached the CD4 compartment and we sorted uh, CD45 RBI, CD25 negative, uh, CD60 dual high, and those would be our naive CD4 T cells. And we injected those cells, we, uh, we transferred those cells into skin recipients. Um, now, skin recipients, I'm, I'm sure you know, they are immunosuppressed mice, uh, they don't have any functional. Uh, T cells. So everything that they receive is something you can assess and track and then measure. One of the things we saw is that by looking at the disease activity index, and this is based on a score from 0 to 4 based on how the mouse looks, uh, how sick the mouse is, uh, we can see how at the beginning of the experiment, mice were not sick, but then as days progress, this adoptive transfer model will spontaneously generate colitis. So inflammation is problem. We could see how the CD4 uh, transferred mice, the PPAR gamma null transfer mice, were showing disease at earlier stage of the wild types. The wild types took almost uh, 70 days to start showing some, some significant uh, score in here. When we sacrifice this mouse, and you can see this in here, the non transfer mouse, the colon looks good. Um, the mice that were transferred with wild type cells, you can see how there's some uh, loss of architecture here. We have some uh, leukocyte infiltration that you can see here. Definitely a little bit of mucosal thickening. But then when we move to the PPAR gamma CD4 specific knockout, I mean, the, the difference is very obvious. The architecture is being completely disrupted. 
there's huge because of the huge leukocytic infiltration. So what this is telling us is that at the tissue level, histopathologically, these mice are doing way, way worse. And we decided also to run post cytometry. And what we observed, similar to what we saw in vitro, is that in ROR and IL-17 in the PPAR demo, uh, no mice they have way more ROR in IL-17 than the wild type uh, liver rate. What happened with FOXP3 is and we checked the spleen, the MLN, and the LPL, and the differences are accentuated in LPL and MLN. Um, FOXP3 was way down-regulated in the PPAR gamma knockout to for specific uh, transfer of months. Also in the LPL, we go from a 29% to a 12%. Which again, this is in line with our computational prediction. Uh, our TH17s in the PPAR gamma knockout, we have more TH17, more RR gamma T and IL17. In the few right onset, we have less FOX3 in the knockout, which is exactly what we saw in the vivo setting. We decided to run a second uh, in vivo experiment, uh, also with uh, adoptive transfer. But in this case, uh, and again, this goes back to a question of how you would set up your experimental validation. In this case, we wanted to validate, if you remember the time course, where at some point we activate the program when TH17 is up, what would happen? This is what we try to reproduce in here. So we have these mice that are transferred with just wild type. Uh, naive CD4 T cells. In this case, we use RAC2 to use a second model of the spontaneous colitis. Um, and these mice went all the way 68 days, and after 68 days, um, we um, optimized the first set. And at this point, what we did was, should, was to, to see what, what are the levels of TH17, to detect that we did have TH17 levels that we can treat. And at this point, from 14 days, we started a daily treatment with bioglinosome, an oral treatment with a mice at 70 milligrams per kilo. So every day I would go to the colony and treat the mice with bioglinosome, and we also had a placebo uh, group with PBS. And the results I will show you focus on, on these 14 days. So you will see the difference. All right, the first thing we saw is that by looking at the disease activity index, of course, at day uh, zero, after 68 days of transferring the cells, mice are pretty sick. Uh, when you start your uh, treatment with bioglinosome, what you can see is how the non-transferred, uh, of course, they have scores of zero. Uh, they are not sick at all. The PBS treated, uh, they continue being sick, so they don't show any, any recovery at all. However, the mice that were treated with bioglinosome, not so much at the beginning, but by day six of treatment, they started uh, getting better uh, and looking way better as well. We also weighed, uh, weighed the mice, and what we can see here is that, um, and before I comment on that, uh, the adoptive transfer of colitis is a model where mice on mice will not lose a lot of weight, but they will not gain weight, so they will remain in this stable state until they are very sick and they, they, they uh, decrease the weight very heavily. But what we can see here is that the mice that were treated with PDS, they were not recovering any of the weight, whereas the mice treated with bioglinosome recovered weight and were very, very similar to the mice that were not treated. Uh, this is a barcode for the histopathology that we took at the end of the treatment. And again, mice with bioglinosome, very reduced glycosidic infiltration, epithelial erosion, and mucosal thickening. Uh, so these mice were doing much better. And this was translated into the flow cytometry that we run. All right, this first row is the baseline, is before the treatment, the uh, bioglinosome treatment, and then we have our PBAs mice and our bioglinosome treatment mice. And what we can see here is that if we check ROR and IL-17 in the lymph nodes, we can see how they go from a 16 and 19 to a 9 and 13. And fox 3 is upregulated. So we are seeing again how when we activate this PBAR gamma, these mice are reducing the TH17 numbers, and they are promoting the T-Rex. So they are turning these TH17 cells into the T-Rex. And we observe a similar fashion in the LPLs, for example, with from 13 to 8 and from 14 to 6. And then from 3, we saw a big increase in T 
deal with uh, 14 percent for Fox 3 in the LPL. And this uh, is in line with the uh, with the time course plot, if you remember, where we activated the bar demo, and then we saw this TN17 going down, and this Fox P3 or e right going up. So what we do with validation is we have our first hypothesis, activation of P-bar gamma in the T17 cell, down regulates R Y gamma C and IL17, and up regulates Fox P3. And we validated that with this pharmacological activation of P-bar gamma using five leaders of what I will show you now. And also in the in vitro side. Secondly, the loss of P bar gamma inverts the ability of T Rex to express the Fox P3, uh, but also accentuates the expression of TH17 related molecules. And we validated that with the P bar gamma knockout experiments in vivo and in vitro using this strategy of the knockout. And last, uh, the increasing concentrations of P bar gamma led to increasing concentrations of Fox P3 and decreasing concentrations of TH17 related molecules such as ROR, DMC, and IL-17. And we validated that with in vitro studies performing these increasing concentrations of, of PPAR gamma. So I want to go back to the first slide and show you what we've done. Uh, we generated, we got the uh, data. We generated the network that I showed you. We implemented the network into Copasi and we calibrated the network with experimental data and that allowed us to run our exhibitical experimentation. And with that, we came up with this hypothesis, p bar gamma, um, when p bar gamma is activated, the TH17, TH17 cell will turn into a T-Rex. And we validated this hypothesis with in vitro and in vivo uh, experiments. And then this data, what I was saying before, is that this data was used to go back to the model for next versions of the model to have a more refined model. So very good conclusions. We created a computational mathematical model of the C40 cell differentiation. Uh, this computational modeling predicted that the bar gamma modulates the balance between T17 and t -Rex. And also that uh, our in vitro studies uh, support this effect of dose, dependent, dose dependency of the bar gamma. The results of the adoptive transfer indicated that the activation of PPAR gamma by this oral administration of 5 glutazone uh, favors the switch from TH17 to TREC, and that uh, PPAR gamma is indeed implicated in the plasticity of this subset uh, in vivo. The loss of PPAR gamma again favors TH17, impairs TREC, and last, and here, this is the point I always want to make at the end of this presentation, is we always try to have this translational value with, with the modeling. The models that you can create indeed can have a lot of translational value. For example, if you, in this case, we detected this node, the bar gamma, and we observe how when you activate this node in the model, the T17 is going to a zebra. Of course, these two phenotypes have opposite functions. One is pro inflammatory, the other is anti inflammatory. Uh, so, for example, if you have a disease on set that's very highly characterized by the presence of T17 cells, uh, and indeed, there are drugs that uh, target uh, or that targeted uh, PPAR gamma. If you can activate that, then you can ameliorate the symptoms of the patient. So I want you guys to keep in mind this translational value that you can also reach with this computational model. And with that, I'll take any other questions you may have. Yes. So, thanks. What can you explain? But how, how the output of the model, the, the information being that the hypothesis was new or different compared to what you put in the model? How did the model advance your hypothesis? Yeah. So the uh, studies that were published before were solely focused. Yes. yes. Um, what he's asking me is what was the novel deal? Uh, what the model added versus to what we calibrated. Uh, one of the good things that we could do with this model is to put pieces, pieces of a big puzzle together. So the previous uh, papers, what they were pointing out is uh, PPAR gamma inhibits PPAR, uh, PPAR gamma inhibits TH17, so that's the end of the story. Um, or PPAR gamma promotes STAT5 or EGF beta receptor, that's the end of the story. But 
we were the first um, <coughs> using this study, the first that we were linking, okay, yes, this is great, these pieces are good, but actually if we put these pieces together using the modeling approach, what we can check is that actually this happens in a single cell environment. Uh, part of these papers were uh, checking that, for instance, the uh, inhibition of r one gamma t p bar gamma can activate or it can happen for other factors. But even that was not checked on a single cell uh, level. That's why we wanted to find this one. Mm -hmm. If you provide the gamma t so the first point you no, this, sorry. the first point you mentioned is that we successfully created a computational and mathematical model of the C focus. I mean, I, I, I'm still a little lost out here as to like what do you mean by a mathematical model in this case? Like, are you getting the analytical expression of the rate constants in some ways, or are you estimating them by solving these differential equations numerically? Or, or what exactly do you mean by mathematical? Okay, so the question is, what's the basis to say that we create a mathematical model? In some in, in how we analyze that math yeah. and yeah. Was it analytical or was it numerical? Like, I would call, I mean, in my you know, they have to call the mathematical some analytical expressions of those mm -hmm. constants and judging by the network that you have shown, like, they look really complex, you have some yes. analytical expressions of those. Uh -huh. So another area, um, COPASI, and I'm telling you this with my perspective from an experimentalist or an immunologist. Uh, I don't have a background in that. But um, COPASI will create differential equations for you. And COPASI will integrate and will solve these equations. There are other tasks in COPASI, for example, sensitivity analysis, and maybe you said you can uh, make an open here that will work your math out to detect, for example, which nodes of the model are more critical in response to different initializations. Um, so there are some tasks in Copasi where you can go deeper in the math uh, and analyze some of that. In this case, uh, for this simulation, we integrated uh, this model using a, a, a LS yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, these are if you're solving these equations numerically, right? Local, 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 local. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> local, local, local. Yeah. Just I mean, that piece. But what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, uh, like, you showed in the very second slide a complex rate constant, right? right? So how do you think about this? Yeah, yeah exactly. So is Copasi helping us with that, or uh, at all? Or is it like, uh, what are the white rate constant? Oh. <laughs> rate loss or kinetic function. It's a lot of this is intuition. There's actually literature around it. There are uh, certain things which are fashionable over time, uh, changing a lot of things. So uh, there are big log models. There are different things that you can test with. And I really every every modeler has their uh, preferred kind of uh, rate loss they use. They are very generic and uh, in this case, uh, well, we had the uh, inhibition or uh, uh, activation of the uh, reaction uh, of, uh, of what some of the processes. Uh, we choose a very simple on-off switch, basically a kind of hill switch. Uh, it was a, it was sufficient for all models. There are many situations where that is not going to come out of this. So this this one looked uh, complicated. It, uh, it's, uh, it's complicated because it has a lot of things turning it on or off. And, uh, but the general form of the rate law was a generic form. I think we're over time for the contact of the new work. Yeah, I did cut off discussion. We need to start at 1.30. Uh, we're going to do a different location. Uh, it might be a good idea to go ahead and break because you'll have a lot of time this afternoon to interact with that and interact with step on and, and really give us some of And if you have any other questions, I mean, we have a whole week ahead of us, so please feel free to reach me and I'll answer any other doubts. One of the other comments I'd like to make is, as you think about this afternoon, keep in mind that your first model doesn't need to be this really complex. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
that's actually a good point. Uh, yes, the way this uh, afternoon, the way we're gonna, because of course, if we just throw the city for bottle at you guys uh, with no capacity expertise, it would kind of be difficult. So we will uh, have this kind of increasing approach. You guys will start creating a model that has three nodes, and with these three nodes, that will give you information on how to build this model. And then you're going to move from three nodes to a model that has nine nodes. And then with that, these nine nodes, you're going to run some in silico experimentation. And we'll show you how to do all these. And then if you're done with these nine nodes and you have more time, then there's another tutorial to reproduce everything that I've showed you here with the full CD4 piece of code. So, so is this model available already? Yes. Okay. And I'll show you this afternoon in the website. You guys can download this one. Okay, so we're going to break for lunch. Now, take your stuff with you. We're going to be